I have a simple question for you. Does 0.999 repeating forever equal 1? Well, it would seem like they cannot equal each other. How can a number that has only 9s in it equal a number that has not even a single 9 in it? Let's take a look at the math. 1 over 3 equals 0.333, repeating forever. 2 over 3 equals 0.666, repeating forever. And 3 over 3 equals 1. 1 over 3 times 3 obviously equals 1. But 0.333, repeating forever, which is equal to 1 third, times 3, equals 0.999, repeating forever. The answers to the same question are different. 1 third versus 0.333, they are the same, but they come out with a different answer. So, are they equal? They are extremely close, 0.999, forever repeating and 1. Infinitely so. But are they the same? Within the real number line, these two numbers are equal. But they can't be equal! They are two different numbers! The real number line doesn't have a number for this infinitely small change. But there is a number for this change, called an infinitesimal. By using this infinitesimal, you can distinguish the difference between those numbers. They are different, and are an infinitesimal apart. Common sense in math has been restored. Crazy, right? Welcome to the world of infinitesimals. An infinitesimal is a number so small that it cannot be measured. A number that is larger than zero, but smaller than all positive real numbers. Infinitesimals answer a lot of questions, like why 0.999 repeating forever equals 1? They are also used in the majority of calculus and explain thousands of paradoxes, but they also raise a lot of questions. I have another question for you. Can you turn a triangle into a circle? Better yet, can you take straight lines and turn them into a curve? There's only one way to find out. We must do it ourselves. First, let's get a circle. Now, let's draw a triangle in it, and another triangle. Pause for a second, and notice that blank space under the triangle. Do you see it? Keep that in mind. Now, let's finish filling the circle with infinite amount of triangles. Now, let's combine all those triangles within that circle into a single large triangle. We know the height of this triangle is the radius of the circle, and the base of this triangle is the circumference of the circle, its perimeter. 2 times the radius times pi. Now, let's find the area of our triangle. Base times height divided by 2. First, take the height, the radius of the circle, and multiply it by the base, the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r. Divide that all by 2, and we get pi r squared. This is the area of the triangle, but it is also the area of the circle. The area of all the triangles in the circle equals the area of the circle. Remember the blank spaces under the triangle? What happened to those? This is where infinitesimals get weird, but they also work. Despite there being extra space in the circle, the areas of the triangle within still equal the area of the whole circle, including the space below the triangles that was not in the triangles. A lot of mathematicians had problems with this. Up until about 60 years ago, we were not able to explain why infinitesimals worked. Simply that they did. There was a lot of talk about infinitesimals, and eventually, a group of mathematicians said that since we cannot explain why they work, we cannot use them. This lasted for a while until a man named Abraham Robinson found a way to prove infinitesimals. How he did it is a little complicated, but the first idea he implemented was the hyperreal number line. Simply, he made a new number line. What? You may ask, how can you make a new number line? Well. It has happened many times. In the beginning, we only had positive whole real numbers. One sheep, three goats, nine geese. Then, we started to get a little complicated by adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing real numbers. But our positive whole real numbers did not suffice. We had to make negative numbers and imaginary numbers. You get the point. Our fractions and decimals had to be adopted all the numbers we know today were added at some point. But these numbers all had practical purposes, and they all had laws that they abide by, that govern their actions, laws that allow us to predict what will happen to the numbers when we alter them. 
So, what's the deal with Abraham Robinson's hyperreal number line? It's pretty simple. This new number line has these infinitesimals in it, along with every real number. The real number line is a subset of the hyperreal number line, meaning that all the real numbers, such as 1, 2, 7 billion, and pi, all these numbers are inside of the hyperreal number line, and it gets even better. All the laws that govern the real number line also govern the hyperreal number line. Just like I can say a plus b equals b plus a, so too I can say this in terms of infinitesimals, which are symbolized using epsilon. And just like I can say 4 times 3 is greater than 2 times 3, so too I can say 4 times epsilon is greater than 2 times epsilon. And just like I can always divide a number by 2 to get a smaller number, so too I can divide epsilon by 2 to get a smaller infinitesimal. I can say with confidence that infinitesimals are awesome, but what are they used for in real life? They explain change. What do I mean by that? For one, they are one of the most critical parts of calculus, the math of change. Let's say I want to find the area under a curve on a graph. To minimize risks or measure electricity, there's countless uses. First, let's take something I know the area of, like a rectangle, and then fit an infinite amount of rectangles with infinitesimal widths inside this curve. All we have to do is add up the areas of the rectangles, and since they make up the entirety of the curve, we now have the area of the curve. This is half of calculus, and infinitesimals make it simple. Abraham Robinson built the hyperreal numbers as sequences of real numbers, such as this sequence, which we call epsilon, or an infinitesimal. The real numbers would be represented as constant sequences, like this. This usage of sequences allowed Robinson to create infinitesimals using real numbers. So here we have right in front of us an actual infinitesimal derived from real numbers. In order to make sure the math worked, Robinson needed to use some pretty advanced tools of modern mathematics, like ultrafilters and Zorn's lemma. But when the dust finally cleared, he had a rigorous foundation for a concept that mathematicians had only intuitively understood. Infinitesimals are some of the neatest little numbers around. Why? Because they give substance to the unimaginable. What do I mean by that? Let's start by recounting a famous paradox called the Fletcher's Paradox. It goes like this. Imagine an archer has fired one of his arrows into the air. For the arrow to be considered moving, it has to be continually repositioning itself from the place where it is now to any place where it currently isn't. The Fletcher's Paradox, however, states that throughout its trajectory, the arrow is actually not moving at all. It is frozen in time. At any given instant, a snapshot in time during its flight, the arrow cannot move to somewhere it isn't, because there isn't time for it to do so, because time is made up of single instants. And it can't move to where it is now because it's already there. So for that instant in time, the arrow must be stationary. But because all time is compromised entirely of instants, in every one of which the arrow must also be stationary, then the arrow must in fact be stationary the entire time. Infinitesimals give substance to these instants. Time is no longer made up of lots of snapshots, but rather infinitely short videos, infinitesimal videos, thus allowing time to go on from one video to the next. This is just the beginning of the magic of infinitesimals, but all in all, we have crossed the boundary of infinity, and we can now think and digest what it is to be infinitely small in the universe, or infinitely large. You know those arguments we got in as kids by saying, I am infinity times cooler than you, I am infinity times two cooler than you, and then your teachers were always like, infinity times two is still infinity. They were wrong. Now that we know our infinitesimals, we can prove it. Epsilon is an infinitesimal, and you know that one divided by a really small number is a larger number. So what happens if we take 1 and divide it by epsilon? We get an infinitely large number. What happens if we multiply epsilon by 2 on the bottom? Well, we get an even larger infinite number. So in the end, 2 times infinity is bigger than infinity. Take that, Johnny. I told you I was much cooler than you as a kid. I hope you learned something today. And thank you for listening. Have a great day.